All right, so I'm uh, Mike Hynowski. Um I'm the advisor for the Amateur Radio Club at Cornell. And oddly, we have to call it the Amateur Radio Club at Cornell, not the Cornell Amateur Radio Club, because otherwise we're branding it with Cornell's logo and they get mad at us. So we're the Amateur Radio Club at Cornell, um, which doesn't flow as nicely. You do you? OK. So uh, I'm the advisor for the club there. I'm also you know, crazy into uh, to balloon stuff. I've, I've flown Picos. I've circumnavigated a Pico. Um, and I've done a bunch of uh, um, balloon flights of my own. So I have to say the students are sort of into ballooning because I'm into ballooning. But I, I want to talk a little bit about the challenges of a university club. And the, the, the number one thing as a ham radio club at a university is the students do not want to talk on the radio. They just don't want to do it. Um, you know, I can stick an HT in their face and they just, they don't want to do it. Some of it, uh, for our purposes, is, is a little difficult. We have a very high number of foreign students, so we have some non-native speakers of English. So that, that can be a challenge. But a lot of them just, the radio, talking on the radio, not an interest. Um, as Ivy League students, they're really, really busy. Um, Cornell has, obviously, all the academics. Um, more about that beeping later. Um, there's the academics of being at a, at a university, but also uh, Cornell is uh, one of the universities that does project teams, which allows students to do really cool stuff. We have autonomous vehicle project teams, rocket project teams, all this other stuff. The students love to be involved in those project teams because it gets them some teamwork stuff that they can put on their resumes, which is uh, actually a draw. There are students who choose engineering at Cornell because of the project teams they want to be involved in. So they spend a lot of time on that. Also, the, the students who come into my club, uh, very diverse skill sets. We have students majoring in engineering, computer science, physics, atmospheric sciences. So I can't count on what skills those students are going to have when they come in. Some of them want to do programming. Some of them want to do electronics. It can be almost anything. Uh, so I spent a couple years as the advisor trying to get my feet under me and trying to get them doing HF radio and trying to get them on the air. And I discovered they just didn't want to talk on the radio. So go with the flow and actually do what I like to do because I don't really care to talk on the radio either. Um, but what was the club interested in? Um, they were really interested in soldering, both surface mount and through hole. I've got a bunch of students who came into Cornell who'd never touched a soldering iron. They're engineering students that had never soldered two wires together. Um, board etching is, you know, old school board etching. You know, if you talk to a, a college student, how do you make a computer board? They say you send the Gerbers off to uh, a, a board house and in 10 days you get a board back from China. They, you know, you can do that at home without an, an etching mill. They, they had no concept. So board etching is actually one of the most popular things that we did. I had to do reprise one of the sessions and do it a second time because the students really wanted to, to etch a board with acid and, you know, safety goggles and all that. Uh, kit building, because they hadn't soldered, a lot of them just building kits was really cool and really fun and a way to get sort of introduced to uh, electronics. Um, one of the topics that several of them have, have mentioned, and I'm glad that they're freshmen because it gives us time, uh, is I want to build a radio from scratch. I don't even know what that means. Let's do that. And I'm like, okay, we'll figure out how to do that. Um, and the balloon launch. They knew I was into it, and actually as since... Uh, kids today, a lot of kids today are, are involved with groups that do balloon launches in their high schools, and some of the people here support those kind of groups. Uh, and they had done a balloon launch in high school, but they sort of didn't know much about it, and they wanted to learn more. So we ended up choosing as a project to do a high-altitude balloon. Um, and of course, oh, twist my arm, right? I'm a balloon guy. Um, so what we wanted to do is let's do a balloon project and let's throw a bunch of technology in here that will interest the students in things that they wanted to learn about. So we put in, let's do some surface mount soldering, let's do some board etching, let's do some Arduino programming, general electronics, and that way they can learn these things which are part of the ham hobby while doing this balloon project. So sort of building on being a ham. So the goal, so we sat down and said, well, what do we want to do for the goals? And this turned into sort of a Monty Hall, now how much would you pay? They wanted to have multiple trackers to do, uh, and to do SMD soldering to build the trackers. Um, they wanted a crossband repeater. Uh, they didn't even know what a crossband repeater is until I explained it. Maybe I wanted a crossband repeater. Um, <laughs> So we put a crossband repeater in the box. We wanted to do DTMF commands. We wanted to be able to send some beeps at the payload and have it do something and know it did a thing. Um, we thought that would be kind of cool. Um, so with the DTMF, we said, let's have it drop a payload. So we set up the payload box, and you'll see we have a payload there to drop. Um, 
We wanted to record video, obviously, the usual set of cameras. So we wanted to have horizontal cameras for video and stills. We wanted a balloon cam aimed up at the balloon camera. And then now, how much would you pay? How about we throw in some live analog TV video, broadcast that down to the ground so we can see the balloon while it's in flight. And oh, you know, we have a, an Azel rotator and a really cool ground station at Cornell. So how about we set up that to receive the APRS beacons and actually aim the antenna at the balloon while it's in flight so we get the best video. And well, we're getting the video at Cornell. Why don't we live stream it onto YouTube so we have live video coverage while it's in the air. And that was all really great. And then we ran out of time. So, <laughs> so we, we actually tested the ATV transmitter. I picked up a Video Links uh, transmitter, which I happened to have for a couple years because maybe it was one of my interests too. Um, and uh, we tested it. I actually have a, a, a friend who's a ham, one of my Elmers, uh, who's a commercial, or not a commercial pilot, an amateur, amateur pilot? I don't know, licensed pilot and has his own plane. That's the words I'm looking for. And we put the ATV payload behind him in his plane and he flew about six miles from campus and we am, aimed that really nice Azel rotator at him and we really didn't get much picture. And at that point we were running out of time so we said, okay, we're gonna put this in the back burner and figure it out. And so debugging the ATV video will be a ham project to learn about attenuation and testing antennas and, and learning where lost signal is happening in a, in, a, in a radio system and that'll be something we'll do in the fall. So, you know, it's uh, it, it uh, turn the uh, the failure into an opportunity, right? So um, I talked about it with the students and they're like, yeah, I'd really like to figure out how to debug that. So now it's kind of killing me because I'd really like to know what's going on and what's wrong, but I'm waiting till fall and then we'll all get together and we'll debug it piece by piece and figure out why the video didn't work. So we had to kill the live tracking and the, the live stream to YouTube and all that, but uh, watch this space. Maybe Cornell will do something really cool next year with that. So the planned con balloon configuration was, uh, you know, you've got the balloon, the, uh, the um, find the little button. Uh, here it's got a button. So we've got the balloon, the parachute, the payload box. That's this payload box over here with the payload that we want to drop. Uh, via DTMF code, and then this payload box down here would just be cameras and things. So this was the plan configuration, and the idea was that we, we sort of calculated it's going to go to about 100,000 feet, so we said, okay, at about 90,000 feet, we'll send a DTMF code to drop the payload, so we'll know that we dropped it intentionally. And, but just in case, we'll have a GPS inside this payload box, and if for whatever reason the DTMS doesn't, doesn't work, at 95,000 feet we'll drop the payload just to, to make sure we drop it. And we'll have a separate tracker on this payload so we can watch it come down. So that's what we did. Um, but unfortunately, and this being a, uh, a university college project, this is a learning curve for me. Usually when I fly payloads, I built everything and I know it all. In this case, we had one student working on the software that's in this payload box. We had another student working on the software that was in the camera payload box. And the student who did the camera payload box had to be at a wedding that weekend, the launch weekend. And when we went to boot up that payload, I couldn't get it to boot. I couldn't get it to work. So we're sitting in a drizzly, rainy venue, which more about that later, uh, trying to get a launch off. And I couldn't get the camera box to work. So we ended up cutting the camera box off and getting a GoPro and duct taping it to the top of this payload box and calling it good for the flight because it's the best we could do. Um, when it turned out later, what the problem was, was that someone, when he cleared off the SD card for that payload box, forgot to put the SD card back in the Arduino. We didn't give it a That's right. <laughs> Jules is the OCD one. I'm, the, I'm Myers-Briggs ENTP, which is make list, lose list. So I write these great launch checklists, and then I don't follow them. So. Here's the trackers we used. Uh, some people may know, recognize this tracker design. It's Alan Adamson's uh, W7QO design that uh, he, he, he let me have and nobody else, so I'm special, I guess. Um, but uh, I've been using his trackers. These are like trackers 27, 28, and 29 that I've built of this model. But uh, this was a student project, so the students got to stick about 60 components each on each of these boards. And uh, we, we baked it in my fancy reflow oven, which is a Black & Decker uh, $5 oven I got at the reuse store um, to, to reflow these boards and they actually worked all pretty much right out of the can. There is one error on these boards. I posted it on Twitter. Some people may have seen it. I'm trying to find it. On one of these boards there are two capacitors like right there and somebody put them upwards instead of that way. And so one of them wasn't working until I saw that the two caps were out of line. 
but uh, the, the students did a great job with the surface mount soldering. So that's the whole tracker. Uh, in fact, I've got two of these trackers stuffed on our payload. And he's actually wearing two trackers back here. Um, so you can see one here and the other one right next to him. I have no idea if the antennas are going to work that way. I think I've just made myself a, uh, a uh, what do they call that, uh, wire. Um, that may be a problem. We'll find out. Um, so uh, that's, that's one of the trackers. And it's got a AAA battery there. And turn it on, you just put those two things together, and the lights start going blinky blink. And there you go, you got a tracker. Um, these make about 15 milliwatts. So uh, for, for uh, when, when I do fox hunts, I, I put the hunt in fox hunts. If you're not under that thing when it comes down, you've got to hunt. It's, it's a skill, not. Uh, um, I do it for fun, so I like the skill of the fox hunt. I know some people are of the different opinion. They want 100 megawatts on their tracker so they can find it even if it landed in a, in a cave. Um, I'm the other school. I like to, to work for it. So. so here's the payload box. And you will notice, so this was a rainy day. The day we did the launch, it was the last chance we had uh, based on weather predictions and everything. So we had to do it because exams were coming up. Here's our payload sitting here. And you, you may be able to tell on this tarp there's standing water right there, and there's a tracker, hint. Uh, and this little fuzzy stuffed bear is sitting in a puddle of water, hint. So here we are, and the even more soggy looking little bear <laughs> hanging there. And there's the duct tape camera we just like, oh crap, and, and stuck it on there because we couldn't get things to work. Um, so we went ahead and we launched. and. Uh, um, more about that later. I've actually got more information. But let me tell you a little bit about the crossband repeater box here. So in this box, we have, uh, we're powering it with Energizer Ultimate Lithium batteries. We've got five of them in series. Um, so they not only makes about nine volts, and when they run down to almost dead, they're still making seven. They're rated at 3,000 milliamp hours. So um, you know, that gives us about three amps of power to work with for the flight. The Ultimate Lithium batteries, if you've never used them, are awesome for high altitude balloons because they work until they're stinking cold. You can get them down to minus 40 and they work fine. Whereas like a LiPo battery, if you take a LiPo to minus 40, it is dead. Um, so these are great batteries. They're expensive, but you get what you pay for. Um, so measured out our payload draw with the, the repeater that's in that box working. We're drawing about 750 milliamps. We didn't expect a full duty, duty cycle with that, but even if we were running full duty, somebody on the repeater the entire time, we'd still have about four hours of power. Um, there's a couple of five volt regulators in there. We had one to run the Arduino and GPS and the servo that does the release mechanism, and a second one with a little bit more power to run those radio modules. So all of that's packaged up in there. And so here's a functional diagram. We bought these cheapy little radio modules for like 30 bucks for two of them or something. So we have a two meter receive module, a 70 centimeter transmit module. We uh, built a highly sophisticated mixer, which I'll show you shortly. Um, the output of that mixer goes into a DTMF decode board. That DTMF decoder is uh, controlled by the Arduino. And uh, it'll decode the, the packets. And if the right signal is sent, it will activate the servo to drop the payload. Um, back the, uh, as backup, we have the GPS here. And so again, the plan was we'll send DTMF codes at 90,000 feet or so to release the payload. But if it doesn't work, at 95,000 feet, we'll, we'll drop it anyway just because it's like science. Um, and also, the CW. Um, tones that you've been hearing out of the radio over here quietly. This Arduino, since we are running a repeater, trying to be good doobies, teaching them ham etiquette, this, uh, this crossband repeater is uh, IDing itself every 10 minutes. Yeah? Uh, no, because the servo doesn't activate for very long. Uh, well, it's, it's actually running the entire time. Um, but no, it, it didn't seem to cause any trouble. Uh, we had a lot of trouble with the DTMF decoder, and I will talk about that. But uh, I don't think the servo was involved, because we've, we've, in testing, even without the servo, we had the same problems. Um, so here's the whole kit and caboodle on a, on a board. So here's our receiver module going into our mixer, goes into our transmitter module. Um, this is a, uh, you can see the heat sink back there for two 5-volt regulators bolted to that heat sink. Here's a stack of five batteries bunch of wires coming out of that whole gizmo. And here's an Arduino stack. There's an Arduino under there, an Arduino Leonardo. Um, and it's got a um, Adafruit data logger uh, board in here, which so we're logging data to this SD card. Note, remember to put the SD cards in these things. Um, and then on top of this is the mixer board that we etched, which the students had a great time etching. Or sorry, not the mixer board, the DTMF board. 
So this has got the DTMF decoder hooked up into the Arduino. Uh, this mixer, um, I will admit, I know nothing about mixer design. So this was just something I threw together because we needed a mixer. So it's got, uh, and I noticed that if we connected grounds together, things went bad. So I have a transformer in there, a whole bunch of trim pots, and a whole bunch of caps. And we just sort of mashed it all together. And it more or less works. It could be a lot better. Um, some of the students are really good at 3D printing, so we really went team overkill on the release mechanism. You can see the servo here activates a little arm that passes through this mechanism. And so basically, I'll, I'll throw you, show you a top view. Here's the top view. The little arm is in there, and the string to drop the payload attaches here. And these uh, on the ends are the tubes, the ends of the payload tubes that you can see on this payload box. And the idea is that we have tucked up in here a parachute. And when that string is released, the whole thing just drops out. We weren't sure at the time we planned all of this whether or not the thing would jostle so much if we had cameras, because originally the ATV camera was going to be in this box as well. We were afraid it would jostle, so we thought maybe what we should do is put a counterweight on the other side so that we drop both at once so that the box doesn't end up like this for the remainder of the flight. Um, because we, we didn't have ATV video in there, we didn't bother. So we're not using one half. But that's why we have these big tubes, because we need to stuff the uh, parachute in there. And uh, this very large, pretty heavy 3D printed thing. We could have done this a lot smaller, I think. But um, for a first draft and something fun for the students to design and work on, it worked out very, very well. So that 3D printed thing is actually bolted to the lid here. The DTMF decoder, if you've never used one of these, is actually a, a pretty easy to use chip. Um, the signal goes into here. Um, they have an oscillator you need to have. Uh, it's got power coming in. It's pretty flexible on power. We power it right off the Arduino. And then it, it has three pins that sort of it activates uh, to let you know when the signal is ready to decode to find out what touch tone is being heard. Um, so we, uh, I designed a board here. And we etched this board, and the students, again, it was super popular activity for students to etch a board. Here is a super popular activity of drilling about 80,000 holes in that little board because we made it an Arduino riser board. So there they are, a couple of them on my uh, Dremel drill press there, trying to get all the, the holes lined up at 0.1 inch spacing. Um, and they actually did a really good job. I can't drill those holes straight. They did awesome. Um, so there's two versions of the board. We built the first one for prototyping. It worked fine. We built the second one. We put more connectors on it for things we wanted to have connectorized. And you can see um, this is uh, the, the students learned what blue wire debugging was. And, did, did <laughs> and we had to cut traces and blue wire a bunch of stuff around because we discovered that some undocumented features on the Arduino Ada logger board, it was using pins it didn't say it was using. Um, and so we finally just said, ah, screw it. We'll just cut the trace and use a different pin. So we ended up doing a little bit of that. But that was all, again, learning activity for college students and learning about electronics. They had a good time. So here's the, uh, the finished uh, proto board that we etched sitting on top with some extra connectors for, here we have DTMF in, connector for the GPS, servo, um, our ID for the repeater, that sort of thing. So that was a very popular activity, etching that. Um, the DTMF, um, this is out of the data sheet for the DTMF chip, and it basically shows that when a DTMF tone is heard on the input, that one input pin we have, it pulls this pin high. When that pin gets pulled high, you know to go ask the chip what tone you're hearing, and you ask it by pulling this pin high four times, and each time you pull this pin high, you then query this pin to see if it's a zero or a one. And so what you get back is basically a four-bit number, so a number between 0 and 15, which gives you the DTMF code, or DTMF tone. So the students got to see this, and then the sample of code I wrote just to, to pull the thing, where here, four times, you pull that one pin high, you wait 10 microseconds, read the other pin, pull it low, wait 10 microseconds, repeat four times. That's getting the DTMF tone off that chip. And so that was kind of a neat thing for the students to see how the hardware sort of meets the software. Um, and several of them were like, oh, cool, that's how that kind of stuff works. So it's very simple. So problems with that system, we had trouble adjusting the audio level correctly for the input. Again, that mixer board um, was a little challenging to use. And we found that the, the, the DTMF decoder is very sensitive to noise. If I just key up and I scratch my fingers across the microphone, it starts pulling up bad, bad tones. And yeah, we had to live with it. We didn't have time to fix it before launch. I did hack together a little low-pass filter. And here's a little college student uh, mentality thing. 
Um, you ask me, how, how do we test a low-pass filter to see if we can filter the audio a little bit? And I think I go into my office and I hack together a little pie filter and do this. And if I ask a student how to do that, they say, well, you launch MATLAB and you put in the parameters. <laughs> Never would have occurred to me to test a filter using MATLAB. Um, but, and that happened a lot, actually. They wanted to use MATLAB. MATLAB is sort of the, the hammer for engineering students. They wanted to use MATLAB to aim the ASL rotator as well, because it had functions built right in, you know, one liner to aim, aim the thing if they could figure out how to get it to talk to a serial port. So difference in mindset, which was a learning experience for me as well. So I did a little pie filter, which helped a little bit. I won't go into a lot of detail on that. We're time uh, constrained. The other thing is that pin that gets pulled high, the ESD pin, the one that goes high when it hears a tone. It turns out when it goes back low, it kind of jitters a little bit. And if you, when it goes low, if you read it again right away, it might have gone high just for a second, but it doesn't really have another tone for you. So I called that jitter, and there was a lot of false positives. I would hit a button, I'd let go, and I'd get like 50 zeros after that because it was jittering. So I put some code in to, to deal with the jitter. Um, the the uh, data sheet actually, uh, again, put a little filter in there. They had a little cap and a resistor to help with the jitter. Uh, I wrote, being a software engineer, my solution was I put a loop in there and just read the jitter away until it was gone, and that helped quite a bit. Um, in flight, that DTMF thing, it worked fairly well up until about 50,000 feet. Uh, after that, we were getting a lot of false positives, and, and people were using the repeater, right? The audio for this is coming through the repeater, um, and people talking were generating false positives, and the, um, the uh, DTMF decoder, if it gets an invalid set of codes, you know, we're using four-digit codes to control the payload. If it gets an invalid one, it would send some tones to tell you it got an invalid one. So what we saw was people talking on the repeater and hearing all these bad code tones going on over and over. And if you tune into the repeater tomorrow and use it a little bit, you may find the same thing happening. Um, and uh, again, I think we'll fix that with filtering. So again, that may be a fall project for us to, to learn more about audio filtering and more about controlling the jitter and the noise f filtering for this DTMF decoder. So another opportunity for us. Um, the thing I goofed at is at 50,000 feet, I really couldn't type tones and get it decoded. I forgot in my car when I run simplex radio, I usually run it at low power. So even though I'm sitting there with a 50 watt radio, I was sending it five watts. So tomorrow, if we launch, God willing, um, I'm going to crank my radio up to 50 watts and see if I can get, it, get through at uh, 90,000 feet. <coughs> Um, so next steps with that DTMF decoder were to fix some of these jitter issues and filtering and things that I've talked about before. Um, the crossband repeater, some of you may have seen these modules, they're from Nice RF, um, and uh, they're a walkie-talkie module. I bought them in pairs for, I think it was like 35 bucks for two of them. Uh, people have suggested, well, you could just cut apart a Baofeng and use that, and I could, and there are actually reasons I might want to do that. Um, what we did for the output is we used, it has a, uh, a Vox activation. So when it hears something, you can actually have it, the transmitter module key up. The problem with any repeater that's Vox activated, if you've used one, is usually you have to make a little noise before it starts hearing. So you have to say, hello, hello, and on the receive side, you might hear hello in the second one. Um, that's kind of a common problem with these crossband repeaters. Um, but other than that, it works. So I do have that crossband repeater running in the box right now. You've hear, heard it IDing itself. So we'll see if it works. Hello, 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 hello. Oh, that's too quiet, probably. Test, test, KD2EAT, testing, testing. So right there, if you couldn't hear it, I said test, test, KD2EAT. The first two tests didn't make it through. After that, it made it through. And that's common for voice activation. So what I might want to do in a future version is gut a Baofeng for the receiver, because I know from some all-star node how-tos I've seen, you can, you can get a, a pin off the Baofeng that knows when it's receiving. Um, and then that would clear up that issue. But for now, again, cheap and easy, and gives us an activity for the next time around. Um, another activity we did was build antennas. Again, hams who don't want to talk on the radios <laughs> don't really know how to build antennas, but we had fun. We, we did some hand-cut dipoles, uh, and you can see, uh, and, and they're highly sophisticated dipoles. Here's one half of the brazing rod out here. The other half we use guitar string, so it's flexible, so we don't break it when we set it down. It's coiled up right now. Um, the the uh, v, or UHF also had a short little dipole. We switched to a wheel antenna, and I'll explain that in a minute. But uh, as a club, we bought 
uh, an antenna tutor, a nice rig expert. So we got to have a little graph, SWR graph, and, and the students got to learn how to sort of nip the antenna down, make it too long to start with, and nip it until you get to a nice SWR as a frequency of interest. And that was, that was a fun activity to, to just learn the basics of tuning SWR and an antenna. So our experiences with that crossband repeater, again, we had the voice delays uh, that I talked about. Um, the output dipole that I had, the, the, the UHF dipoles, I had on a little bit of an angle, hoping that I would hit the ground. But the problem was that I think the repeater box was spinning, so what we ended up getting was flutter on the output. It would, it would sort of pan across, and some people would hear it, and then it would drop out for a second, then you would hear it again. And so what I wanted to do is have something more omnidirectional pointing down, which is why now that's got a wheel antenna sitting on top. Um, Bill might recognize that. That was the wheel antenna I'd intended to use for ATV, <laughs> for the analog TV, and I just hijacked it and said, well, it's, it's, it's a wideband antenna across UHF. It'll work. Maybe. We'll find out tomorrow. Um, so I stuck that on there uh, for next time. Uh, so, uh, but we did have people, I was, I was surprised, I did uh, announce our, my flight around in central New York, and I was surprised how many people were trying to hit that repeater from all over, from Pennsylvania, from New England. It's like, who are these people? How did they even hear I had this thing going? I was, I was pretty excited about that. I talked about the mixing board before, and we are tight on time, so I'll skip over it. It's suffice to say, I don't know nothing about no mixers, but that's what I built. And it kind of works. Um, camera payload. The box you do not see has three cameras in it. It has a horizontal camera pointing out to take snapshots. It has another horizontal camera pointing out to take video, so I can do both at once if I want. It's got another upward-facing camera for the balloon cam, hoping to capture the balloon burst. Also, that payload box will sit below this one, so we'll make sure that camera's on when we drop the payload, so hopefully we see it whip by or bash into the camera or get tangled or whatever it's going to do. So that is also controlled by an Arduino. So. Being a, being a cheap bastard that I am, um, I, uh, I bought some cheapy cameras for like 25 bucks off Amazon, and I opened them up and I soldered on some blue wires and added some little connectors so I can remotely control these cameras from uh, an Arduino. So literally just exposing the buttons is all I did with that surgery. Um, and built a little, this is a board I built, which has, these are optocouplers. So the optocouplers are there because some of the buttons on the camera, you can't just touch the wires together using transistors. So I just used optocouplers, and that, that solved all my problems. So some optocouplers there, and uh, th we use an Arduino Feather for this one. So there's a Feather uh, M0 under there, and another Adafruit uh, Ada Logger board that's got data logging, and uh, uh, a GPS chip, or a yeah, GPS there. And you'll notice the SD card I didn't put in is sticking right there. <clears throat> that would be the problem. Uh, with the, with the board the last time. So I talked about those problems. I just literally, you know, one of my checklist items is clean off the SD cards because I've got a scar from the time I didn't clean off the SD cards. It didn't have video because it was full of crap. Um, so I cleaned off the SD cards. I had them all set out on my desk and I lost count of how many I was actually using because I was also cleaning off my FPV camera, the SD cards from my airplanes and I just thought that was for something else. <laughs> so that's what happened. So. We launched without that camera payload box. We just, uh, somebody who was there happened to have a GoPro, so we just, he, he volunteered it and stuck it on top. The DTMF, as I said, worked early in the flight, but at about 90,000 feet, we couldn't get the codes through, so it fail safe dropped itself at 95,000 feet. Um, we discovered the bear fell way faster than testing indicated. We actually, my office is in a seven floor building. We did highly scientific testing. We dropped the bear down the stairwell and uh, we timed it a bunch of times. And it's kind of hard to get good data doing that, but we figured the, the drop rate was somewhere between three and five meters a second. Couldn't really nail it down because it kept bouncing off walls. Um, but, you know. <laughs> But worst case, it should have been five meters a second. It ended up falling at like nine meters a second. And we think because the bear was really, really soggy. <laughs> so, uh, so the bear fell really down. So we thought we lost the, the, the payload in Cayuga Lake. Um, and I'll show you the, the, uh, the stuff in a minute about that. So the main payload did great, though. It climbed to 109,922 feet or so. Um, uh, that was about 9,000 more than predicted because we didn't have the big heavy camera box. We just duct taped another camera to the top. Um, we expected due to the reduced weight, uh, or we expected that. Uh, what did surprise me is that it fell faster than we expected. Um, and again, it should have been lighter. It should have fallen slower. But it brought a lot of parachute back with it. So I think the parachute 
sort of tangled up. And we just used the, uh, the estimations on rocket man parachutes, which is what we used, uh, their estimate of, of descent rate. And I've talked to some people subsequently, and they say, nah, rocket man parachutes, I think they're really assuming you're, you're using a rocket and there's no uh, leftover balloon flailing around there too. So that's just a, a data point for the future. If you use the rocket man, uh, estimations, I think if you're using a rocket, probably okay. If you have a bunch of latex balloons flopping around with it, probably a little optimistic. So here's the main payload flight, and you can see we launched, and in, in New York we have this problem, we have these long finger-like projections of water across the state. Um, that we have to sort of manage to dodge around. So my usual routine is our APS cover APRS coverage here near Ithaca, there's, there's where we live. APRS coverage over here is really good. APRS coverage out in the Catskill Mountains out here, not so good. And mountains, not so good. Uh, especially with 10 mil 15 milliwatt trackers. So what we usually do is drive somewhere and try to bingo Lansing <laughs> out here, which is farm country. Um, northeast of Ithaca. And so the actual um, flight, because it was lighter, went higher. The white is the actual, so it went higher. But it fell a lot faster than predicted, so the end result was pretty much spot on. Um, so the predicted balloon landing was here. The actual balloon landing was here. This is about, um, uh, it, it's, it's like a couple hundred yards. <laughs> it was really, really close. I've got a, if Tori is watching from high alt, uh, horizon, overlook horizon balloons, he, the previous year, landed one, I think, down here in the woods, and we, I teased him that he missed landing in the nudist camp, which is right under the two in W2CXM. <laughs> so we're driving by, and I look, and there's the nudist camp, and there's our payload 100 feet past the, <laughs> the front gate. Fortunately, the other side of the front gate, otherwise retrieval would have been a new and interesting problem. Um, so yeah, the nude camp is there, and it was down here. Now you will notice here, all these trees. And when I finally got the final beacon, I'm like, ugh, here we go. Welcome to New York. You know, I've got all this farm field, and I land in the one tiny patch of forest, state forest we have right here. Um, but I got really lucky. See this two-lane dirt road cutting through the woods? That's where our payload was. <laughs> really, really lucky. I thought for sure it was going to be in the woods. And the nudist colony entrance was like, you know, 100 feet back. So, uh, so that was the main payload, so that was a, a good recovery. While I was with a few students recovering the main payload, a bunch of other students uh, were out trying to get the bear, um, which took a less fortuitous uh, um, path. We can see here the projection for the bear. We had projected that it would drop at 90,000 feet, which is where we wanted to drop it. Instead, the failsafe dropped it at 95,000 feet. But we expected it to descend at a nice gentle four to five meters a second. Instead, it dropped at like nine, like a plunk. And you see it's sort of falling behind in this long finger-like projection of water. And uh, here's an above view of what we saw. We wanted to land over here in the nudist colony. Instead, we uh, kind of fell over there. And what was even worse is we're watching this trajectory. We see it going east, going east. It's like, great. And then it started turning north. It's like, no. And then at the very last minute, it turned west. And it was, this was the last known packet at about 4, 1,300 feet. The lake is at 400 feet above sea level. And we're like, crap. We just dropped it in the lake. Um, as it happens, we found out later, didn't know this at the time, so this is late breaking news um, since Hamvention. Um, as it happens, it didn't land in the lake. Right there on that point happens to be a power plant. We have a coal plant for, for Ithaca. There's a gigantic pile of coal. Here's the railroad track that runs right up the side of the river in the, or the, the lake. The only thing that goes up that railroad track is a train full of coal that stops right here to discharge coal and then go back where it came from. And the payload came down, and you know, we saw it going off west. This little building right here, the guy who works there has to check the tracks every week or so to make sure there's nothing on them. He opened the front door and found the tracker sitting right there between the tracks. <laughs> so my new friend TJ met me at Barnes & Noble and uh, brought, the, brought the bear back to us. That was about two weeks after the flight. So we're kind of up against the wall. I made like a six minute video, but I'm already over time. Um, but the video sort of, there's, you can see happy students getting ready to launch. So there's our flight video and, and folks getting ready to launch in the rain. Um, again, we sort of had an um, unfortunate day to launch. It was a complete uh, cloud deck that day. 
Um, but you know, once you get over the clouds, it's, it was really kind of pretty. Um, so, and we did get up to 109,000 feet. So we had some nice video from up there. Um, but other than that, the video was pretty boring. Um, so after action, let me just tell you a little bit about what we learned. Um, after after the, the flight, we actually had a, a few of the students do presentations, or at least one, a presentation about what they did with their code, show and tell. That turned out to work really well. It's sort of a peer thing. The students are talking to other students about the piece of the project that they worked on. And I just like really liked how that went. And so a note to self is, if I do these projects in the future, we're always going to have a sort of peer presentation, especially if we're breaking off into subgroups, peer presentations with each other. I thought that was awesome um, and very well received. Uh, so more student show and, show and tell stuff, and uh, probably somewhat less lofty goals for the project. Um, you know, we had a lot to do here, and students are busy, so um, it was a little tough to cram it all in. But that's, that's life at a university ham club. So with that, um, if you want to go look at the video, it's about six minutes, especially if you like Pink Floyd, because I like Pink Floyd, so there's a six minute video with Pink Floyd of the, the video flight, or the flight. You can uh, look for it on, online, W2CXM, Whiskey 2, Charlie, X-Ray, Mike. Um, just Google that, you'll find the video. Uh, any quick questions? I'm sorry, we're running a little over. Were you gonna do the bear drop? Oh, the demo! So I tried the demo at Hamvention, and it didn't work, because it was a demo. So well, first of all, let me just show. One thing we learned is that I don't know CW. The students don't know CW, but we tried to be good hams. So we had it return CW, QSL for I understood the command, or QS something else for I didn't, or QLF for the CW people here, um, uh, for I didn't understand the command. And we discovered that we didn't understand the code it was telling us whether it understood or not. So we also added some other tones, sort of a doo 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 happy tone and a doo 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 sad tone. So let's try, see if we can get a sad tone here. That's a sad tone. So that's our DTMF uh, code saying we, we have a sad tone. Okay, so here it is. No pressure, no pressure, little bear. Here we go. Hey! <laughs> and hopefully the little bear will do that again tomorrow. <laughs> oh, the miracles of high technology. Okay, I don't want to interrupt. If you have questions, catch me at lunch because we're running long. Thanks, yeah, everybody.